LA Noir is not just a game that was inspired by the crime riddled Los Angeles of 1940s. It often echoed the actual events of the past as well, with many crimes being a rendition of recorded events. Previously we have gone through all the cases in LA Noir and the real history behind each one, but that's not where the inspiration and influence of the true crimes end. When driving around the semi-free world of LA Noir, Phelps can be radioed into impromptu crimes that can optionally be responded to. Known as street crimes, these pocket-sized crimes are also often inspired by real history. Rockstar themselves haven't disclosed the real crimes that have inspired these cases, so this video is just the links that I have found, which means that they might not be exactly correct, as they are just my opinion, or fully exhaustive, as I have yet been able to link most of the street crimes. However, there are multiple cases that have strong parallels to the true crimes of Los Angeles. So let's delve right into the real history behind the street crimes of LA Noir. Cosmic Rays is a possible mental case at the Alico station which is located at the corner of Wilshire and Flower Street. Found there is a disturbed subject, wearing a wire-laden metal pot on his head and attacking the owner of the Alico station for allegedly trying to control him with cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are particles originating from the sun and other stars, most commonly supernova explosions. They have incredibly high energy, nearly moving at the speed of light. In the 1940s, cosmic rays were marvelled, with many trying to figure out how to utilise the high source of energy locked within. They didn't yet know the source of these rays, but if it was to be found, it would put a mighty weapon into the hands of its discoverer. American scientists at the time ridiculed the idea of a cosmic ray bomb, with their interest in the cosmic rays being centred around unlocking the mystery around the forces that held the nucleus together. But the Americans also believed that the Russians were looking into cosmic rays for weapons, which led to much propaganda. On the 21st of March 1947, 56-year-old Thomas Quartarella, disturbed by the cosmic rays, confronted Ernie Stelzer at the Flower Street neighbourhood gas station. You're the guy that's been sending cosmic rays into my room, exclaimed Thomas, before he stabbed Ernie, sending him to hospital. But in this real story, this Flower Street disturbed individual didn't have a strange pot on their head. More curiously, he nailed tin into his suitcase in order to repel the cosmic rays away from his food. Gang Fight Phelps and his partner Bukowski are called to the scene involving two local Mexican-American gangs, the Third Street Gang and the Diamond Street Gang, who are provoking each other. Normally just empty posturing, the gangs decide to open fire with Phelps having to subdue both gangs. On the 4th of June 1947, four teenagers were held over the slaying of 18-year-old Edward Martinez. Martinez was identified as a member of the 3rd Street Gang, and was shot during a fray with the Diamond Street Gang. Martinez had fled down an alley, jumped a fence, and ran towards a tree before he was tragically fatally shot by the Diamond Street Gang. This appears to be the first recorded event of the Diamond Street Gang, with at least the Diamond Street Gang appearing to be still active until this day. Earl Bush ended up taking the rap for Martinez's death, and received 1-10 to 10 years in prison for manslaughter, with the 3rd Street Gang planning to get him once he was released from prison. Amateur Hour Receiving a call of a burglary in progress, Phelps and Bukowski arrive at Silman's jewellery store where they confront a group of novice thieves, triggering the alarms by blowing a hole in the wall to access the high-end jewellery, but they can't even seem to open up the safes. On the 12th of September 1947, employees of a neighbouring bakery called Hollywood Jewellery Store owner Mort Silman and reported a hole had been cut in the back of his store. According to police, these robbers also failed to enter the vault, as apparently the fumes from their small torches drove them away from the small office containing the vault. Perhaps a bit less amateur, these thieves took elaborate precautions so that their work could not be seen from the street, covering the office door and the front of the store with a tarp to prevent lights from shining through. But unlike the crime in LA Noir, these individuals managed to escape, swiping $10,000 worth of jewellery from the show trays before leaving, 
but they lacked a complete set of safe cracking tools, including torches, oxygen masks, hoses, and goggles. Hotel Bandits Phelps and Bukowski receive a call about a robbery happening at the Bristol Hotel, with the suspects being linked to previous armed robberies. When they arrive, they discover that the hotel's receptionist is emptying money into a suitcase, with the robber fleeing the scene, shooting, and making it to his accomplice, commencing a pursuit with Phelps. On the 17th of September 1947, a group of bandits was reported to have struck again, robbing the Crescent Heights Hotel. Also having been linked to robbing many small hotels, two men arrived at the dead of night to case the hotel, inquiring about room rates to night clerk Charles A. Schenck and soon later, they returned with guns, forcing Charles to open the safe, even having him to give up his own ring. But unlike L.A. Noir, no police made it to the scene of these hotel bandits, with them jerking the telephone from its wiring to try to delay the police, and driving away in a car with no license plates. Hung out to dry. Hung out to dry reunites Phelps and Bukowski with notorious tattle Oswald Jacobs, who works security at Holcher Textiles. Jacobs has seen a gang of punks break into his textiles in order to rob it. I've been watching the place for 10 years, waiting for something like this. Calm down. On Sunday, the 2nd of March, 1947, textile factory owner Bernard Holcher reported to the police that burglars entered his establishment unlocking a service entrance and driving a truck into the factory. Unlike L.A. Noir, these thieves managed to steal between $75,000 and $100,000 worth of equipment and materials. After their plunder, they returned to the scene with a can of gasoline, with the intention of burning the place down. Security guard F.E. Barron reported that the burglars fled after an exchange of shots, which sounds a bit more brave than our Mr. Jacobs. For now, that book marks our examination into the real cases behind the street crimes of L.A. Noir. It only scratches the surface of the street cases available in L.A. Noir, and you may have noticed the cases we talked about are only from the traffic desk. It's quite likely that other street cases have been inspired from real cases, and they do seem to be much harder to find, perhaps more loosely linked. So if I do find more connections, maybe we'll have another small video on the way. The 1940s for Los Angeles was riddled with crimes, and a lot of it unsolved, so it's interesting to realise that not only most of these cases in LA Noir are real, but many of them have remained unsolved, with writers drawing their own conclusions. A lot of these street crimes actually got away with it in real life, so it's quite liberating to be able to catch them in the game. Thanks for watching my unusually quick video, and I hope to see you guys again.